Since the rigid refinement of my early virtues, I have discerned instinctual connections to exorciated survival. Natural selection is a decisive element in the competitive exclusion principle. In other words, our reality is premised on the survival of the fittest, and we celebrate the achievement of our finest contenders with a plastic memento, painted golden as a symbol of our exemplary conquest. With the victory come the spoils. But I expended the entirety of my high school career as a ruthless thinker and a worrier, withholding anxiety to motivate myself to achieve absolutely nothing. I was playing a celestial game and I couldn't claim to win. I pinned my persistence on the state of my survival. I was vying for my life in the crypts of my mental hellscape. My soul continues to ache from my distinctive parameters, and I was never fully compensated for the endeavors of my anguish, nor will I ever be. I loathe the trophies of my life. My mind does not begrudge, does not intuitively begrudge intrinsic value to a metal. My mind does not establish sentiment in the triumph of my prowess. My mind wishes it could exile the notion of accomplishment and victory, suffering credence in the subliminal effects of adopted arrogance. From a modest and coherent perspective, my conscience has never acknowledged the empowering impression that awards have bestowed upon me. Reflecting on the past, I was blessed with a sensitive personality and an empathetic heart. I was a boy that always needed the undivided love and affection from his mother. Indeed, this quality was particularly beneficial to my preliminary moments of judgment. Additionally, I could utilize discretion when I, use, when I sense the agony of humanity, so my world purely revolved around an isolated system, my family, friends, food, and video games. In the past, the roots of my spirit flourished with optimism and tenderness, but nowadays I can no longer account for such warmth and kindness. Awards have subconsciously affixed an immense pressure on my shoulders, and I fear that the anxiety from this force has doomed me to self-retrogression. However, now we shall peer through a window, a window into my ultimate facade, that is, one that I had cast in the memory of my eighth grade awards ceremony, a time at my happiness on the brink of my hollow crusade. An applause proliferated its prominence as I trekked across the auditorium to become the first recipient of the Alyssa Ferguson Humanitarian Award. A synopsis of my school activities, mentoring work, and community volunteering monotoniously circulated through the acquaintance that I once knew. Alyssa's mom gave me a crying hug and her dad saluted me after the principal transferred the plaque into my unbodied hands. The adversaries of my composure maneuvered to the podium. The speech was in order. My eyes glared with the twinge of my dubiety, and the illusion of my passive comfort floated away from the projection of implicit camaraderie. A wrinkled note of succession rested on the daunting balance of my aura, but my unmitigated devotion to Alyssa's memory domineered above a weaker thought. While approaching the barrier between anxious cowardice and imposing inquisitiveness, my hand reached out to the border of my command. My thoughts pleaded blank. My shoulders surrendered their tension, and my mouth sputtered autonomously, divulging the attention of a comical adherence. Man, what a night, am I right? It was pitiful. Silence permeated through the atmosphere as my trauma leached into the wells of an innocent's dominion. An improvisation magnified in my sights, and my conclusive reception yielded a grave tone to my candor. I proceeded to make an intrapersonal agreement that signified a divaricating path to my narrative. The origination of my vocation to the amelioration of society sprouted in my virtue, and the constraints of my despair became my despair become, became unbounded from a stipulation of opportunity. I drew a line in the sand of my character. When I traversed, an entity of my former self emerged. With similitude to a snake, I shed my skin that I had, I had outgrown, revealing a mirror of my brutal expectations from the hint of my prior, agreeable persona. It was an awakening of inverse enlightenment. I relished the metaphor that I reside within a pasture of snakes, and every step of the stage meant a closure to the blazing flame that I safeguarded from a fatalistic smother. A novel purpose fell before me. 
No longer would I be seen as the soft and naive and overweight simpleton that everyone loved to jeer in their feeble interpretations. No longer would I display my impressionable demeanor. No longer would I be weak. That day brought my life into sharper focus. Now I have Alyssa's spirit weighing on my testament, propelling me on to excel and shun the face of failure. She assumes the epitome of my relentlessness. Although she endured four years of brain cancer surgery, chemotherapy, and experimental drugs, she consistently illuminated the halls of our proud institution with her soft smile and vi- with her soft laugh and vibrant smile, all while trying to maintain her perfect grades. In my regretful recollection, the promise of my obligation to philanthropy was forgotten. I have become entangled in my ecstasies of cultivating the highest grades and climbing above all in the bureaucratic battleground. Though, through my works in literature, I preach the dire necessity of spending my time wisely. But I must admit that my headspace would not welcome the presence of this practice two years ago. I have broken many hearts, and I have stumbled upon the critical apprehension of my peers. My system was no longer isolated, so I found resolve in a merciless methodology. Six months before Alyssa died, the Make-A-Wish Foundation contacted her family and explained that she could have whatever wish she desired, a trip to Disney World, the happiest place on earth, a week in New York City, seeing the enticing plays and sights, or a trip to Hawaii with the ocean's clearest waters and falls of natural enchantments. Being Alyssa, she turned them all down and asked for a well to be built in Africa. Today, Her church sustains her work with the Living Water International Organization to supply clean water to more villages in developing countries, carrying on the brilliant legacy of her selflessness. Alyssa is certainly a hard act to follow. I vowed to fight for my academic success to the same magnitude that she was willing to struggle for her life, and my life has never been the same. As I drive my car to school, I prepare for a mental battle that helps me conquer my day, my assignments for, the, for that day. My mind elucidates the definitive speci- specialty to my no mercy philosophy, delineating war with the obstacles of my success. The grinds of my coffee flow bitter with the burden of the truth, and the sips of its rustic, rustic composition warm my coveted soul. I am a perfectionist, one who does not settle his, their disposition in the company of a standard negation. I am not a humanitarian, nor have I aided someone without the conflict of interest as a benefactor. I am an undeserving fraud, and I lie to myself through the channel of external scholastic ascendancy. I am a disgrace to Alyssa's everlasting light, so I must pay the price. I must repent for my stolen valor. Before my final remarks, I must translate and reference a motif for Mark Twain's two views of the river. My exposition yearns to discern the imbalance from the shadow of my career. Twain wrote about his memories on a steamboat, noting the disparities that constitute a qualitative decline are all dependent on time. As I look around, the people that sit next to me are far too familiar. I practically grew up with them. The apostasy in my temperament corresponded with the pessimistic developments of modern civilization, and I employed its embrace to gain respect and acceptance as an independent, determined powerhouse, a force not to be reckoned with. Nowadays, I sense that I am resented for my pretentiousness. Solemnly, I am a victim of my own misguided medium. However, perhaps my brash assumptions are fallacious. Perhaps our regard for one another is implicit and we cumulatively concede that our gratitude is inherently transacted. In continuity of the historically parallel echo, I can vividly recount the joy in my eyes when I indulged in the world of Minecraft with my forgotten friendships. I can describe binging SpongeBob and Drake and Josh and iCarly with my brother, who has since matured and departed outside of the bubble. Everyone in this generation has probably experienced this specific equivalence of the past, yet our love for each other neglects to be all the same. Times used to be simpler, and Twain coined the detrimental effect of progress as it degrades the irreproachable essence of life's beautiful obscurities. 
There are wonderful people in this world that do not receive the abundance of praise and approval that they substantially deserve. Unfortunately, I abandoned these genuine individuals in my niche. This was a flaw in my desire for a ticket to the apex. So yes, I am a component of a broader cohort within the collective issue, but I'm currently attempting to mend my woes. Seldom does an honest person realize accreditation for their genuine character. We should exhibit more appreciation for caring, thoughtful, and sound world changers like Kenneth Revilla or Kate Harper or Sahana Parikh who actually facilitate a sincere and welcoming complexion. They are the torque that rotates the wheel of humanity's positive advances. They guide us to the limit of our sanguine certitude for a better tomorrow every single day. We should observe the story of Alyssa Ferguson. She could have wished for anything to her heart's desire, but she used it to help others. And deep down, I, can, I candidly divulge that I wouldn't do the same. As the wise Dumbledore once stated, help will always be given at Hogwarts, Harry, to those who ask for it. I'm afraid that I cannot describe the plight of my accommodation and semblance. Three years ago, I was drowning in a mental tsunami and no one was there to save me, not even my own mother. I was the one who cared. I was the one who bore goodwill for all beside me. I was drowning, but I floated to the surface on my independent means, and no one will even remember.